Lead okay. us not to temptation, but deliver us go. from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a very Islamic prayer, I would say. because um, But it's not a Christian prayer. Certainly not according to Christian doctrines. And I'll explain but why. In terms of our debt to God, that is a far bigger debt to be paid. And there's a lot more suffering involved. Everybody who rejects Jesus is going to be punished eternally in hell for all of their sins. So for a finite number of sins, they're going to be punished eternally, which is in itself unjust. But then all the Christians who believe in Jesus, all of their sins have been put upon Jesus. De physical death and exile. That's all hell is. Hell is exile from God's presence. When he was put to Jesus that you claim to be God, he said, why are you offended that I call myself the son of God when you are called, ye are gods in the Old Testament? The when entire crucifixion narrative is, is fundamentally tortured and backwards. And this is, from a theological perspective, this is what I find most difficult in actual fact is because it demonstrates that there's no concept of forgiveness in Christianity whatsoever. Uh, and the reason is for that, because if I if I wanted to forgive you, if I, you know, we, we're taught in the Lord's Prayer by Jesus, oh Lord, forgive us, that you'll, you'll know the words better than I will, forgive me if I butcher this. You know, uh, all of, all I, of I'll say it really fast, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And okay. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us go. from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a beautiful prayer. And it's a beautiful prayer. It's a very Islamic prayer, I would say. because, um, But it's not a Christian prayer. Certainly not according to Christian doctrines. And I'll explain why. So, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, what is the nature of our forgiveness of other people? Do we have to punish another person uh, because uh, somebody has forgiven us? If, for example, my brother um, trespasses against me, do I have to, what is the nature of my forgiveness? The nature of my forgiveness is that punishment is waived. That punishment is an actual fact waived. And that's actually the sign of our love. It's also a sign of my purity that uh, I can waive punishment. And that is what forgiveness is. If I take out that punishment on somebody else, or if he owes me a debt and I recoup that debt from someone else, you cannot describe that as debt forgiveness. That is seeking and obtaining the debt. So with respect to Jesus, this is from a theological perspective now, not so much historical. This is my big problem with Christianity, which is that it has no forgiveness because everybody who rejects Jesus is going to be punished eternally in hell for all of their sins. So for a finite number of sins, they're going to be punished eternally, which is in itself unjust. But then all the Christians who believe in Jesus, all of their sins have been punished, have been, have been, have been put upon Jesus. So when you look at it in the grand total and scheme of things, God has not actually forgiven a single uh, sin that anybody has ever committed. And furthermore, God actually becomes a hypocrite, God forbid, because he tells us to forgive others. He says, and he teaches us a prayer, oh God, forgive us as you, as we forgive those. So we're actually more forgiving than God. We can waive punishment, but God can't waive punishment. And that's actually a sign of him being unholy. But for us, it's a sign of our holiness. So this in actual fact demonstrates that the entire crucifixion narrative is, is fundamentally tortured and backwards. In the Islamic narrative, Islamic understanding, when you seek God's forgiveness, God indeed forgives you as you forgive the trespasses of those against you. you he waives the punishment. And he says, it is waived. It is, it is written off. There is no debt. God has ignored it. God is the, one of his attributes of Allah is the effacer of sins. He effaces them, not by collecting punishment for them. So that's one point I wanted to make. And I, I just want to okay. say on the question, I... accursed, the idea I... that, the idea that relationally, and I want you to speak to this and, and explain this to me because I don't get it. If somebody has done wrong to me, right? I cannot, me taking out that punishment to somebody else doesn't fix my relational problem with that person. That person has still done wrong to me. It doesn't become right by virtue of that, by me taking out punishment on a third party. And so not only is this fundamentally unjust to the the third party, it doesn't actually solve the relational issue. And Jesus becoming a curse, a la'ana, which is the word in Arabic, it's also similar in Hebrew, it is the attribute of Satan. So in actual fact, God in actual fact regarded Jesus as Satan for, through no fault of his own, but for the sins of others, and it didn't actually fix God's relational problem with them, and God didn't demonstrate any forgiveness. It's, it's a complete mess. Okay, you've been gone for like four minutes. Can I respond in about the as, same as, length of time? As long as you wish. I've got no problem. That's absolutely fine. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I want to let I'm you sure, I'm sure James um, might have a problem if it's as long as you wish, but I mean, you know, within reason. No. Okay, there's a there's a lot of things I want to correct there. Uh, for one thing, we know, we do not say the punishment for sin is eternal torment in, in hell. That's not in the Bible. It says the wages of sin is death. 
the way God punishes typically, the main ways he punishes, is physical death and exile. That's all hell is. Hell is exile from God's presence. See my video, Does God Send People to Hell? Uh, God is not punishing people for eternity for their sins in hell. They have been exiled. And as C.S. Lewis said, when it comes to the doctrine of hell, it is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out past sins and give them a fresh start? He did on Calvary. To forgive them? They don't want to be forgiven. To leave them alone? That's what hell is. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. C.S. Lewis also says the doors of hell are locked from the inside. Again, this is about exile. So that's one thing to keep in mind there. And there's also that you you mentioned it's eternal conscious torment. I'm actually an annihilationist. So I don't think hell is eternal. Um, that seems to be more in line with what a lot of the yeah, it seems to be more in line with what a lot of the early church fathers taught. Uh, there's also universalists like Origen, for example. So there's a lot more uh, there in terms of Christian eschatology and Christian afterlife. With regards to the atonement, God is not punishing a third party because of the, tr the Trinity. Jesus is God. Jesus takes the punishment upon himself. If you steal money from me, okay, and I forgive you of your debt, the, the debt is still there. I have just taken the debt upon myself now to pay. You know, When you forgive someone, it doesn't just go away of the sin. If someone were to kill my family members, I take and I forgive them. I have taken all that pain upon me to absorb and then to just sort of disperse it through my own therapy, whatever you name it. Sin always comes with these types of shames, these feelings of guilt. When we forgive others, that doesn't go away. We just start to absorb it. God is taking the punishment upon himself. He's not putting it on a third party. He is taking it for us. And if anyone wants more, I did a whole video on this back in August called The Absurdity of Christianity, where I explained that the atonement is the reflection of God taking the punishment that we have, uh, taking the punishment of sin upon himself in a physical manifestation of that. All that suffering, all that hardship, all that hurt of what sin does is taken upon the cross, and it's a physical manifestation of what sin causes. Anytime, anytime somebody sins, that doesn't just go away for forgiveness because the person who's doing the forgiveness is taking the, the punishment upon themselves in terms of that feeling. And it's best represented in the terms of debt and money, these kinds of things, which are analogies used in the New Testament. If you told, took $10,000 from me and I was going to use that money to buy food over the next year, okay, I now have to, and I forgive you, I now have to suffer that lack of food over the next year. It doesn't go away. There's still suffering involved even in terms of forgiveness. What we don't realize as humans is when we forgive little things, we recognize there's little suffering, like when somebody just tells a white lie or maybe steals something minor. But in terms of our debt to God, that is a far bigger debt to be paid, and there's a lot more suffering involved. And so Jesus shows this in terms of the whole system that he set up with the atonement. Uh, sin, you know, you have to, it goes back to his, how he, this is typologically fulfilled in Jesus with how uh, you need to do animal sacrifices in the Old Testament to atone for sins. Jesus then eventually takes this full punishment, the full weight of it upon himself, who is God, who did set up the system. Jude 1 says it was Jesus who led the people of Israel out of Exodus. This was whole, his whole system. So yes, Jesus, and in terms of the whole Jesus claim to be God, again, I go back to what Jesus directly says. He calls himself Lord, Lord. That is in the Septuagint. That always refers to the Tetragrammaton. Jesus says that about himself. And there are numerous other places Jesus does this. Thanks. James, can I just respond to that before we go to questions, if that's okay? Oh, we got plenty that. of time. Okay, sorry. Yeah, great. Okay, it's fine. Um, so I think that this is really interesting. So, um, you know, forgiveness does not involve shame. Okay. Anybody who genuinely forgives another does not experience shame or guilt for forgiving. In actual fact, forgiveness for anybody who's done it, I'm sure you have, Michael, and perhaps you can reflect upon your own experiences and the viewers can reflect upon theirs. When you forgive somebody for a wrong done to you, and it is sincere forgiveness, not lip service forgiveness, but sincere forgiveness, it never involves shame. It actually is a moment of joy. It is a moment of joy that you have been able to uh, fully embrace the other person despite what they did to you. There is not a hint of shame within it, and there is not a hint of guilt within it. And the best example of this, I would, I would refer you in actual fact to the story of the prodigal son. This is Jesus's understanding of forgiveness. And I would ask you, where was the shame of the father when the prodigal son returned? Oh, I, I know. Where I know was exactly the, where, where it was. Where was, it wasn't there. There so was the shame of the brother who he told, you know, that your brother has come back and we must embrace him, okay? And we must be grateful that he has returned. 
But the father didn't have, if he had any shame, it wasn't for the fact that he had to punish himself. The father didn't go through internal punishment because his son came back. It was a moment of joy. He laid on a feast for the man, for the boy. So in actual fact, this is the true aspect of forgiveness. But you don't believe in forgiveness. You believe that God has to punish, that he either punished himself or he punished Jesus. And this is also a bit of a, a bit of a misrepresentation, not intentionally. I don't want to accuse anybody of that, God forbid. But I feel it's a misrepresentation of Jesus's position. Jesus never claimed to be God. You can say he claimed Lord, Lord. As I've mentioned to you, in every scripture, if you read any religious text, the prophets of God always claim to be the messengers of God and the spokespeople of God. And by virtue of their appointed position as the spokesman of God, obeying the messenger of God becomes obeying God. This is why the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it is said okay, in the Quran about him that, um, you know, it is not you who took the oath of allegiance, but it was not your hand on top of their hand, but it was the hand of God. Nobody can ever claimed that Muhammad was God. Sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. But if I can, can I respond now? I'll just finish real quick on this, if okay. I may. You know, the key point for me is that Jesus never requested worship towards himself. He always said to worship the Father. Um, he always mm. said, he, nobody ever bowed down to him. You know, there yeah. was a woman who bowed down to him, uh, seeking his blessing. But nobody ever worshipped him as he, and he never asked anybody oh. to worship him. He requested people I to wanna, worship the Father. Just, just to also bring us more centrally uh, to the topic, but also sure. if you're able to wrap this point up, and then we'll kick it over to Mike. Yeah, I'll, yeah just, I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely wrap it up now. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that when Jesus was, it was put to him, this is the final point I make, when it was this put is... to Jesus that you claim to be God, he said, why are you offended that I call myself the son of God when you are called, ye are gods in the Old Testament, when he, you know, when they picked up the stones to stone him. So he manifestly demonstrated his reference to himself as the son of God in the terminology of the Bible in which even the children of Israel were called gods. Okay. Uh, first of all, none of the early prophets ever called themselves Lord, Lord, and Jesus definitely accepted worship. If you go to Luke 4, 8, Jesus says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Okay, That word for worship only shows up one of their places in, in Luke's gospel, and it's in Luke 24, 52, where the disciples worship Jesus. Jesus definitely accepted the very worship he said was only for God. So you have there. With regards to the prodigal son, yes, the father did take shame upon himself. If we understand the cultural context, it's very much in the story. Okay, The prodigal son comes to his father and says, I want my inheritance now. And the only proper response in that culture would be to beat the son because that'd be very shameful. The culture would know you were doing this. He gives him the money anyway. Then when the prodigal son returns home, the father runs to meet him. In that culture, the original heroes of that audience would have understood this as a very shameful act. Men did not run. Women and children ran. Men did not run. And then he throws a feast for this son who, who uh, shamed his father in multiple ways, taking his money, ruining it. And the father throws a feast for him. The, the community will look at this as a huge shameful thing. This is the response from the elder brother. To, to, he leaves. He goes out into his field of works because he's like, what are you doing? This looks horrible. And look at what you're not. You're not giving me a feast, this kind of thing. This is very much would look very shameful to the surrounding culture. This was very much in the cultural context of that time. It was a very much an honor shame culture. So, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by bringing up the prodigal son story. That very much has implements of honor and shame woven throughout. The elder brother even shames his father by not coming to the party. This is very much in that culture. This is all talked about in David De Silva's book, Honor, Patron, um, Honor, Patronage and Kinship. I think that's the name of it. So I think, you know, the, the key thing there is that the, the I, and I, as I agree, we've got to get back to the topic of the crucifixion itself, but uh, you're taking other people's shame and saying it's the father's shame. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other people would have been felt shame on behalf of the father, perhaps by saying, my God, he's really you know, he's not honoring himself. He's not showing his dignity, right? But that's their shame, okay? The man is running down the street to meet his son. He's not experiencing shame. He's experiencing joy. You know, how is that in any way correlative to Jesus suffering on the cross and going to hell for three days and three nights? And him saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. I don't think my Jesus God, my God, hell. My God, okay, that's fine. So my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And so this is an actual fact, a... Uh, this is a post hoc Christian reading of the prodigal son. The plain reading, again, I, I'll emphasize the plain readings of all of these things, which is that the prodigal son was met by a loving and joyful father. 
Okay. Other people may have had shame on his behalf, but the father didn't have any shame whatsoever. Um, I, I, and the point I want to get back to with the crucifixion narrative 